Good morning, folks. It's dawn, November 29th, 1935. We're in Guam's Apra Harbor at our mooring in the China Clipper, the Martin M-130 flying boat operated by Pan American Airways. That, upon completion of our uh, of our last leg today, when we land in Manila, this aircraft will become the first aircraft in the world to cross an ocean in commercial service. And as we've said before, not just any ocean, but the Pacific, the world's widest ocean, crossed at its widest point. You know the drill. We left Alameda, California. We flew to Honolulu, Midway Island, Wake Island, Guam. We have the last leg to fly today from Guam to Manila. And when we land in Manila Bay this afternoon, we will have uh, successfully followed in the footsteps of the inaugural flight of the China Clipper and as we get closer to Manila, we'll talk uh, a little bit more about why it was as historic as it was and uh, the impact it had on the world. I've got a few more passages out of a couple of books I can read you. For now, let's just take a look at the flight. And uh, as you saw at the end of the last video, we're in Apra Harbor here. We're moored right over here. I did find one other picture I thought might be interesting before we get into talking about the whole flight. Just talking about Guam. I had said I couldn't find a whole lot of history about Pan Am on Guam here. Um, I did find this picture, which is over here. It's of an old, uh, decrepit pier, as you can see. This watermark caught my eye. If we blow this picture up, you can see that the name of the photo is Lost Clipper, Guam, JPEG. And it's watermarked with uh, a website, lostclipper.com. That website is dedicated to investigating the loss of the Hawaiian Clipper, which was another Martin M-130 boat that was lost between Guam and Manila a couple years later, 1937-ish maybe. But anyway, there's a good collection of old Pan Am Clipper history on that site, lostclipper.com. And... Uh, I will show you a couple of their pictures. But I believe that that, that pier, it's not here. It's, uh, it's over here. I believe it's this old, I don't know if you want to call that a pier, but jetty. I believe it's this right here. And this is where the old photos layer on Google Earth showed a, uh, a little plaque that talked about this being the, uh, the landing site of the China Clipper. I have a photo of that from that lostclippers.com website. I'll put it in the slideshow. But... Uh, what I think this means is that this is where the clipper moored right out here, Smyrna Mooring Ball, and I believe probably people were brought ashore right here because this is a marina here, and one of these buildings here, eh, I've lost it now, but one of these, these buildings is a bar probably here, and it is called, uh, what is it called, Clipper Landings, I think. So I'm guessing this is, uh, we're seeing legacies of the old Pan Am system right in here. But anyhow. On with the flight, huh? Why is it November 29th? Talked about that a little bit at the end of the last video, I think. We landed in Apra Harbor on the afternoon of November 27th. The crew fully intended to get a night's rest and launch the following morning, as they'd been doing, and make this flight on November 28th. But when they arrived in Guam, they were advised they were delayed a day because someone in the Pan Am PR department had somehow gotten confused about the international dateline and scheduled the arrival ceremonies in Manila for two days hence, so on November 29th. And so uh, the crew, and they were ready to fly this last leg and be done with it, right? I mean, victory was within their grasp at this point, but uh, they had to sit idle for a day here in Guam. And now it's the morning of November 29th, and they are ready to get going, and so am I. A little bit excited to, uh, I, I don't want to say get this over with, but finally successfully complete the journey here. So here's our here's our flight plan, and it will look familiar. It's a straight line this time. There is no aim-off procedure. Checkpoints every hour. Dead reckoning. 
supplemented with um, celestial fixes when we can get them. We'll be able to take lines of position off the Sun and Venus is visible. It was visible in the sky at this time in 1935. A skilled navigator with a sextant could find it and so uh, Noonan, you know, reference taking celestial shots off the Sun and off of Venus. So fair enough to follow in his footsteps. We'll use Sun and Venus lines of position supplemented with Huff Duff lines off of Guam. Until we, uh, until we get out of range of the Huff Duff on Guam and then an interesting thing happens. In my testing to set up for this leg I discovered that the uh, the Huff Duff stations that are included in that weather ships gauge that I'm using to simulate the Huff Duff, the Manila one, I can't make it work. <laughs> no matter what I do, I cannot get a sing signal off the Manila um, station. I think there's something wrong with it. So I think we're going to go ahead and say that we uh, we got a notum this morning that the Manila Huff Duff station is off the air. So we're going to have to complete this the second half of this flight celestially and with dead reckoning. But I'm hoping that it won't be a problem because you can see that we have something we haven't had for the last several legs of our journey, and that's some uh, some significant land to look for as we get closer. And as a matter of fact, after checkpoint nine, we start flying by small pieces of land. Even even over here, I think we'll be seeing this land off to our south. But here we fly right over Tanaga Island almost, and over. Um, Bales Island here, so we should have good visual checkpoints. We're going to cruise straight across or, uh, Manila, the Philippines here, straight across this uh, this part of the the landmass. Come right across uh, the city of Manila. Going to fly right across what where the, the modern day airport is, and I've removed it, but you can still sort of see the outlines on the ground. And uh, land in Manila Bay here, and. Again, I don't know exactly where the clippers moored, but I've found references that it was in Cavite, Cavite, however you say that. And since this was U.S. naval land, I'm going to guess that once again they uh, they were using the navy facilities and mooring over here somewhere. So that's what we're going to do. And that will mark the end of this procedure. And. Uh, And it will have been quite a ride, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, here's our flight plan. We're set up and ready to go. The winds are entered. Same crew flying the flight. 1,837 pounds of mail. No supplies again because we left those behind on the atolls. We've planned the flight to take 10,300 uh, pounds of fuel. We've managed to throw an extra 10,000 pounds of fuel on board to top the fuel tanks up, which brings us almost up to gross weight. We are planning on the flight taking 9 hours and 4 minutes. It's a distance of 1,391.9 nautical miles. I don't think there's much else to tell you. Once again, we'll have the tender tow us off the uh, tow us off our mooring here, and the wind is out of the east, so we'll taxi over to the west end of the bay there by that carrier. We'll make our takeoff run to the east into the sunrise with a right turn out over that bay and over Sume, and on course to the west towards the Philippines and our place in history, huh? <laughs> There's a little Coast Guard uh, frigate out there as well, we'll go by. And uh, our initial heading set, 276 degrees. You can see the, uh, the winds out of the east, so we're taking off into it, like a right turn out over the Pan Am Village area. Take off, we'll call it at 32 past the hour.
trims are set, controls are good, cow flaps are open, props are full forward. Turn the pedo heat on. And uh, here we go. Get her up on step here. There we go, there's the step. Heavy again, but come on, there it is. Pull the power back to Line power setting. for 110 miles per hour climb speed or actually knots I should say I believe that is calibrated to knots and that's what we flight plan in now yeah, the Pan Am Village would have been right over here somewhere we'll be cruising out right over it Another spectacular Pacific Island sunrise. Sperry Autopilot's on. One more Dawn departure. pick up the slideshow now and I will talk to you guys again once we have some land insight towards the end of this journey.
as you can see, we are feet dry over the Philippines. We just coasted in through that big bay there, past a couple islands out there, which we did visually confirm. Flight's progressing really well, although we just found some rain. But uh, if we take a look at the map, speed's holding up okay. All right. When I left you, we were on the way out of Guam. You can see uh, several Huff Duff shots and celestial fixes. These are primarily Sun and Venus shots, and we did get one good three-star fix out here. This was a Sun, Moon, Venus shot just before coasting, because remember we had no, uh, or well, wait, I'm not sure what that was, but this was a Sun, Moon, Venus shot for sure here. This was our last reference by Checkpoint 8 before we started seeing some land. We did get some land in sight soon thereafter. We'll take a look at the uh, the track afterwards, but we cruised pretty well right through here and visual confirmation on Tanaga along with the sun line just to confirm it and nailed exactly where we thought we were. Baleson Island here, same thing. Uh, well, I didn't bother to take a sun line. I could tell where we were. Right in through Limon Bay, we're over the um, the central part of the um, this island in the Philippines here. You can see off to the left this sort of dual lobed water feature here with this big spit that extends south right out into it, right? And uh, that is the very creatively named Laguna de Bay. So we're somewhere right around here and there's that spit that extends south out into the lake. And uh, well you can see what's right in front of us, can't you? Manila Bay. That would be that light blue tropical water you're seeing just below the bank of clouds right there. That is Manila Bay. So, the end is in sight, guys. So let's see. Looks to me like on our current ground track we're going to cruise right across the northern end of Laguna de Bay, which, yep, we are supposed to do exactly that and we're going to uh, fly right over the city of Manila. We're actually going to fly right over where the Manila International Airport is in you know today's world, obviously. It certainly wasn't there in 1935, and we're going to land in Cavite, uh, or I'm sorry, in Manila Bay here, and park over here by Cavite City. Cavite? Cavite? I, I know I'm butchering these names, I'm sorry. But Manila Bay, and we know this is where the Clipper landed. I don't know, unfortunately, exactly where they docked other than that it was Cavite City, so it was over here somewhere, and a lot of this is very shoal water, so I'm thinking it was probably up here, and this was U.S. Navy land as well. So, the end is in sight. The, uh, the nav log says that we should be hitting Manila Bay around uh, 0530, and it's currently 0517. That's a little bit past where it said uh, it wanted us to start down, so I'm going to call that top of descent, and we're going to go ahead and start a descent now. Get rid of the altitude hold feature of the autopilot. Pitch us down a few degrees. I am stupidly a little bit more excited than maybe I ought to be that the end of this journey uh, is in sight. Not because uh, I have uh, grown to dislike it or anything, but just because it's been a long time coming. That being the case, let's hustle on ahead a little bit, shall we? I think as soon as we get below these cumulus clouds or through them, we'll see that uh, that area of Cavite City sticking out. You can find some real-world remembrances of uh, people that were in Manila watching the Clippers arrive, and even especially that first one. Apparently, the crowd that showed up in Manila Bay to see these this Clipper arrive is uh, it puts to shame the one that was in San Francisco Bay to see it depart. We 
which is kind of funny to me. But there is, uh, there is a great picture, and of course, we'll get it up in the slideshow here towards the end, of the uh, China Clipper sitting in Manila Bay, just surrounded by all the locals' boats. You know, all these, these crazy cobbled together little craft, and bigger, you know, and more, uh, more modern craft as well. But they're, they're just mobbed by all these boats. It's hilarious. All right. I think... Go back to normal air. Get ourselves on down a little further. I didn't realize how poorly we were descending. Because it looks to me like we're passing over Manila right now. Let's go outside and look around a little bit since we have that luxury. I suppose you know what used to be there. I did my best to remove it. Oh, control tower is still there. <laughs> so that is the, uh, the modern day Manila airport. And, uh, through the clouds down there is Manila Bay, check our descent right here, still not coming down as fast as I'd like to, come on, let's get on down. Laguna de Bay looking southwest there, and that's looking straight south, and here is, well, there's Cavite right there. So there's Manila Bay, downtown Manila, Manila Bay, our final landing point, and that right there is what's known as Cavite City, or Cavite, again, apologize. And that is uh, what I believe was a U.S. Navy airport. I'm not even sure if it's there today, but our docking place is going to be right in here somewhere because it's just the best guess I have. I wasn't able to find out exactly where the Clippers docked in Cavite here. But that's it. That's Manila Bay. What I think we ought to do at this point is turn the autopilot off. And uh, the Clipper crew, of course, did a little celebratory circle of the bay here. And since we need to lose some altitude anyway, <laughs> We might as well do that as well. Let's do a 360 out here. Winds are out of the northeast. So we're just going to do a right 360 basically and land to the north in front of uh, Cavite City. It's not all that hard if you can accomplish any suspension of disbelief at all to... Uh, Imagine just how satisfying this moment would have been for the crew of that first Clipper flight. It was, what, seven days ago that they left San Francisco Bay, struck out over the ocean at night, bound for Honolulu. And uh, there were a lot of people in the world who said that what they were trying to do couldn't be done, even though that's a little bit odd, is it? had been done by other aircraft before, but not in commercial service and not with the degree of uh, scheduled precision and reliability that the airlines were trying to bring to this task. And these guys did it. They absolutely did it. And so, as they're doing their 360 around Manila here, you can only imagine that uh, <laughs> they had to feel a little bit vindicated, right? I'd have been a little bit more motivated, I'd have figured out how to put in a bunch of AI boat traffic down there to have to land along, because apparently that was, they said, one of the more dangerous parts of the whole trip was trying to land in Manila Bay with these thousands of boats down there just zipping around everywhere. <laughs> but there is a limit to how much work I can, I can put into this stuff, right?
And this was a big deal for the folks in Manila, too, not only because it was just a big deal in terms of accomplishments of the modern world, but because, uh, which almost sound, sounded critical to Manila, like they weren't the modern world. I didn't mean that at all. I meant everybody was excited about this because, of course, you know, this Trans-Pacific Air Service was a big deal to everybody. It was a big accomplishment, no matter who you were. But it was important for the uh, the folks in Manila, too, because it was it was a tie, both in terms of trade and in terms of uh, keeping in touch with relatives and that, that were over on the U.S. mainland, the U.S. West Coast, especially. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, instead of a, a steamship that or a steamer, I should say. I don't know that they were really steam-powered, but, um, you know, an ocean liner that would, could take you to the U.S., and how long might that take? At least a month, I would think. You now you can do it in six days. You have to assume that was a big deal. Everybody, even if they were people who thought that they would probably never do it, if you read the accounts of people, even people who were little kids here watching this aircraft land, it was, they felt the momentousness of the moment, you know, they, they understood that, that it was a world-changing sort of a thing. Alright, we're on what we call a, uh, we'll call a right down when I'm actually going to start a base here. The plan is to land back to the uh, northeast, right out in front of that, that bay that's Right there, I think we'll try to land, like, right through here. And boy, if you're at music base to final. If there was ever a landing in your career, you didn't want to screw up, right? <laughs> don't run over any locals' boats. Don't smack it on and damage it. This one needs to be photogenic. down in front of Cavite City. 0532. 0532. And that is that. <laughs> somewhere right around mid-screen there. We're by that hut. would make a good spot. I'll go ahead and get us over there. We'll do one last little debrief, take a look at the map, talk about a little bit of the history of this last leg, and that'll wrap it up.
All right, here we are shut down and warped to our pier on the Cavite City Peninsula in Manila Bay. The China Clipper is shut down. They're probably, probably already servicing her in preparation for her uh, return journey back across the Pacific tomorrow morning. She's been a good old gal for us. Let's take a look at the final flight here. Guam to Manila. This will be familiar by now. The yellow line is our uh, planned course line. Yeah, not sure how that happened. But the yellow line is our planned course line. The green lines are celestial lines of position off of um, mostly the Sun and Venus. We got a couple moon shots toward the end because it rose. The blue lines are um, bearings off the Guam Huff Duff facility, so they're radio direction finder bearings. Little south at top of climb, little north by checkpoint one, and so on. You can see the Huff Duff bearings run out about halfway, and we don't get any from Manila because, as we said, the Manila Huff Duff station is out of service for some reason. But that's okay. We made it with Celestial and Dead Reckoning just fine. We even started getting some three body fixes, like I said, uh, the Sun Moon Venus fix here. There wasn't much of a uh, zenith, or I'm sorry, azimuth distance between. Uh, two bodies there, but then uh, things had spaced out by here that we got a nice shot. If we take a look at our, our track, you're going to see that, of course, just like in the other flights, we actually did roughly what we thought we did. This navigation stuff works, huh? North by checkpoint one, getting back on course by two, three, four, did a pretty good job right through the middle. You notice the checkpoint four uh, fix was pretty late. There were storms over checkpoint four, but we were fine. Got a little north, got back on course, got a little south, caught it with this last fix, which put us right back into position for a nice entry into Limon Bay here, and uh, flew visually past Tanaga Island, Bailson Island, and here's where I picked you guys up with the video, and we flew past Laguna de Bay, and here's our 360, and our landing right in front of Cavite City, and there's where we're currently moored. And if you look at this leg by the numbers, we flight planned it to take nine hours and four minutes. We planned to land at 544 Zulu. We actually landed at uh, 532 Zulu. So we were 12 minutes early off of a nine hour flight. That's not bad. Again, it amazes me how well this uh, this navigation to dead reckoning works in flight sim. And if you look at the remarks over here, I think you can see pretty much what we talked about already. See here's the late storms over checkpoint remark, couple course correction notes, what we got some celestial LOPs off of. But uh, I think that about that about tanks it for leg five, huh? So as far as the the whole thing, because not only is that the completion of leg five, that's the completion of the journey. We've we've accomplished what we set out to do. And if you zoom out and take a look at the whole thing, it's a little bit of a trip, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a third of the globe. But there you go. We left uh, San Francisco Bay to Pearl Harbor in Honolulu to the lagoon on Little Midway Island to the lagoon on Tiny Wake Island to Apra Harbor on Guam and now to Manila Bay in the Philippines and that completes our recreation of the China Clippers inaugural voyage. And I would like to close this out by reading you one more passage from, uh, well, we'll do that in just a second. I, don't, I wanted to show you the flight time difference too. The real China Clipper, on their inaugural journey, they flew 8,210 nautical miles, and we did that as well, since we followed in their footsteps on the track. Uh, but it took them 59 hours and 48 minutes. And you can see we did it in 54 hours and 5 minutes. So we did it about 5 and a half hours quicker than they did. And uh, I would assume that the majority of that difference is due to winds. I think I may have flown 5 to 7 knots faster in terms of indicated airspeed than they did. So that might eat up a little bit of it as well. But for the most part, I mean, we're right in the ballpark there, I think. I think this was a fairly historically authentic recreation of this journey. 
I'd like to close it out here by uh, reading you a passage from the text that was my primary source in recreating all of this. It's a book called China Clipper, The Age of the Great Flying Boats by Robert Gant. I read from it once before when we left uh, Wake Island. I'm sorry, when we left Midway for Wake Island. And uh, I think this passage detailing the crew's arrival in Manila Bay is a fitting way to close this out. Before I do that, I just want to say one more time thank you to anyone who's come come along with us here. It's been uh, it's been a little bit of an adventure. Now then, none of the hoopla of the inaugural flight quite matched the celebration in Manila. A hundred thousand excited greeters watched the China Clipper appear on the horizon. After a circle of the city, the giant craft landed in Manila Bay. A swarm of fighter planes flew overhead in salute. Hundreds of small launches escorted the clipper to her landing barge. Through flower-bedecked arches, the crew walked ashore. Newsreel cameras whirred while Ed Music presented a letter from President Roosevelt to Governor Quezon. There was a motor parade, a banquet, and official reception. The man of the hour was Ed Music. The press hounded him for comments. He was asked to describe the historic flight across the Pacific. True to form, Music described in two words one of the most momentous feats in aviation history. Without incident, he explained. But the spotlight remained on music. Despite his wishes, he could no longer escape fame. The first trans-Pacific flight of the China Clipper earned for him the prestigious Harmon Trophy, previously won only by two other Americans, Wiley Post and Charles Lindbergh. The cover of Time magazine featured his face. He was besieged by requests for interviews. Ed Music, whether he liked it or not, had become an authentic American hero. Not only was Music a celebrity, so were the China Clipper and her two sister ships. Whenever one of the Martin M-130s lay at her mooring in Alameda, crowds gathered. The very name, China Clipper, conjured up a spell of adventure. California to Asia in six days. The sense of wonder was the same Americans would feel half a century later for the orbiting space shuttle.